Americans finish at 5.30 if you scoot over there. And uh, the movie is only about an hour long, so then there'll be plenty, t it'll be early to finish before dinner. Uh, tomorrow, as usual, we have a half day off. And on Thursday evening, we have the uh, closing dinner. It's going to be in the main dining tent, and uh, it'll be catered, so there'll be food more than the, uh, more than the um, uh, welcoming uh, reception that we had. Um, and I think it's BYOB. So. Um, and I think in terms of that, and the other cross-program activities this week I wanted to remind you of, so on Thursday and Friday at our normal time, 3.15, there'll be presentations by the uh, undergraduate group, the Experimental Math Lab. So there'll be uh, presentations. Please come and uh, be encouraging for them. So anyway, let me uh, get started um, for today. So we're extremely pleased to have uh, Marina Vyazovska. Uh, she's a woman who almost needs no introduction, but I'll give her a little one. <laughs> So uh, first of all, uh, let, let me point out that she is uh, our other Clay senior scholar. So the Clay Mathematical Institute sponsors two great people in the field. Uh, we've already had a talk from our other Clay scholar, Hendrik Lenstra, uh, in week one. And uh, Marina is the second uh, person sponsored by the Clay Mathematical Institute. So we're very grateful to Clay for sponsoring her visit. Uh, in any case, as I say, she almost needs no introduction, but let me say it anyway. She's Hot off the press, the most recent Fields Medal winner. I don't know which of the four you're the last one, then you're the most recent. But <laughs> anyway, we're extremely pleased to have Marina Vyazovska, who is you know, a great expert in sphere packing, spherical design, and approximation theory. She has many great accomplishments to her name, and many more coming in the future. And we're really pleased to have her here at PCMI this week. Yeah. Yeah, so thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm happy that I could finally make it and be here. And uh, for these two days, I do enjoy this summer school a lot. Uh, so today I will speak about sphere packing, my favorite topic. And uh, so I will try to make this talk interesting for everyone, for those who already knows a lot about sphere packing, and for those who don't know much about sphere packing yet. So. Uh, so here's a, a picture which explains a little bit what we will be talking about. So uh, these are actually the shade balls on a lake which is supposed to be somewhere in California, not that far away from here. And you see that balls on a, uh, on a lake, they uh, arrange themselves almost into this uh, perfect uh, uh, <coughs> hexagonal lattice. And we think that they arrange them like this because this is the best packing in dimension two. And so, so but uh, so what is the sphere packing problem? The sphere packing problem is the following one. So suppose that we have a big d-dimensional box, which is big in all of its d dimensions, and we have an infinite supply of uh, uh, <coughs> balls of uh, radius one, and so the radius of the ball is much smaller than the size of our box. And then our question would be, how many balls can we put into the box? And if our box is very big, then what happens at the boundary of the box is not that important for us. And the only important thing is that how many balls per volume can we fit inside? And so for each dimension, uh, we will we'll denote by delta D the maximal possible density of the balls inside of the box. And the density means that the portion of, the, uh, of, of this box covered, by, uh, uh, covered by, by the balls. And so, of course, this is, uh, I'm a bit, uh, for those who is a mathematician, you see that I'm a bit hand-waving here. And of course, to give an exact definition, we need to do a bit of analysis. But in the Euclidean space, fair packing problem, it's a very nicely behaving problem. And so whatever effort we make, we will usually arrive at the reasonable answer. So I will not go into details and just la la leave us with this intuition. And so, okay, so let's look at the dimensions that we all know and love, the dimensions one, two, three, which we can experience in our everyday life, so in dimension one-dimensional Euclidean space is just a line, and the ball in one-dimensional space is just an interval, and we can, can cover our line with uh, unit in intervals, 
or oh, actually if it's radius two with uh, intervals of length two with almost no blank space left. And so the density of sphere packing in dimension one is a trivial, it's trivially one. So case is solved here, it's a trivial problem. And in dimension two situation is a bit more interesting. So uh, two dimensional Euclidean space, it's an Euclidean plane, like the stables that are in front of you and a ball in two-dimensional space, it is a, a disk. So you can think of a coins lying on a surface of a table and they would like to put this coin so that they cover as much of the surface as possible. And so by a, if we are playing a little bit, we will see that the best we can do is probably the, uh, this uh, hexagonal uh, lattice. And so the hexagonal, uh, this hexagonal sphere packing uh, covers slightly more than 90% of the surface and nothing better can be done. And this is not a trivial, but still a rather easy uh, problem. And so it was solved, uh, uh, essentially the solution was obtained at the edge of uh, uh, 90s and 20th century. And, but then it was uh, in, like in the middle of uh, 20th century, like more rigorous argument was found. And so now we know that this is indeed the correct solution. And in dimension three, so the best solution is this uh, pyramidal shape. So the way we uh, stuck oranges in a supermarket. And so this configuration, it covers about 74% of the volume. And uh, uh, this, uh, a problem about uh, packing three-dimensional balls in three-dimensional space. It is known as Kepler's conjecture, and it has a very long uh, history. And so, so it started back in 17th century, and actually, uh, and pr probably this problem was considered long, long time ago. And I, I'm sure that every ancient civilization would have an ideas about how to pack balls and derive and uh, proofs to that, but in, uh, so to say, in what we call in a modern uh, history. So probably the first per person who started thinking about this problem was Thomas Harriot, and his um, uh, re reason to start working on this problem were very practical because his uh, uh, sponsor, a British aristocrat, asked him a very practical question. How many cannonballs can he put inside of a ship? And so Thomas Harriet, as a British scholar of that time, who actually uh, spent a lot of time here in the United States and made some uh, considerable contribution to the study of American continent, he started thinking about this question and he ca came up with several not with one, but with several solutions uh, that cover this 74% of the space. And he described it in, in his letter to his uh, patron. And as we already heard uh, yesterday, that at 70th century, people still did not have archive. They could not post their great ideas and immediately share them with everyone. So at that time, people wrote letters to their uh, colleagues and Thomas Eriot wrote a letter to Johannes Kepler, where he desc described his discoveries about the sphere packing and three-dimensional space. And he also thought about maybe it is uh, these properties of this packing, maybe they are somehow related to the atomistic theory, which was a hot topic at 17th century. And that maybe uh, the condensed bodies we see around us, they also consist of atoms and those atoms are packed in a similar way as the oranges in a supermarket. And Johannes Kepler really liked his ideas and he wrote, actually he already published an essay which he uh, dedicated to his patron of, of uh, that time. And of course he, di he did not mention Thomas Eriot in his essay at all. Uh, but he also wrote, he wrote about uh, uh, the packings in three-dimensional space and where we can see such structures in the nature. He wrote about um, uh, the, the f shape of snowflakes and how snowflakes ha all ha always have exactly six edges and maybe this is related to the packing problem in two dimensions. And he wrote about beehives and how they're similar to this uh, 
uh, orange stacking configuration we have seen on previous slides. And he also wrote about atoms and that maybe atoms inside of condensed bodies, they also are packed like uh, cannonballs in a ship. And our days, we actually understand uh, condensed matter much, much better. And we know that these ideas, they were very uh, revolutionary for 17th century, but still rather naive. And this is not how atoms behave inside of condensed body. Also, uh, actually, I think in a, like, uh, recently I heard the talk about how snowflakes are formed and why they have exactly six edges. And it also has nothing to do with packing problem. <laughs> so all these were really great ideas, but uh, and very important way of thinking, but now as, as much as we know about universe about us and as much we know about physics, so they do not apply directly to those physical problems. And so, but the, the question whether this particular uh, configuration of balls is it really the densest configuration in dimension three, it remained open. And of course, neither Thomas Eriot, neither Johannes Kepler could have asked that question in the 17th century, because at that time people did not uh, think much about rigorous mathematical proofs. However, this question became famous as Kepler's conjecture. And as mathematics advanced, people started thinking more and more about proofs and about exact uh, uh, statements. But this uh, theorem, it this problem, it turned out to be a not an easy one. And so to explain you why it is a difficult problem, maybe I would like to explain you another version of it. I would say a much easier local version of a pecking problem, which is a, a problem of kissing spheres. And so what are the uh, kissing sphere configuration? It's a configuration which consists of one uh, red uh, sphere of radius one and several blue spheres also of radius one. And the rules of our problem are the following. So the all, all blue spheres, they have to touch simultaneously touch the red one and they don't should not uh, intersect. They might touch each other, but they're not allowed to intersect. So all these blue spheres, they're kind of kissing the red one simultaneously. And in dimension two, as you know, uh, th this is an easy problem. So we see that we have one uh, uh, red disc in the middle, then it can be surrounded by six other uh, discs. And it's not difficult to see that uh, seventh one is uh, impossible. We cannot put one more disc here. And in dimension three, it is uh, not such an easy problem. So here is one possible configuration is that we put one uh, red ball inside and we surround it by 12 blue balls. And the centers of those blue balls are in the uh, vertices of uh, icosahedron. And so this way we see that we can have a kissing configuration with 12 blue balls. However, is it possible to put one more? And here it's really not obvious that we cannot put one more. And it's because uh, all these blue balls, they all touch the red one and they do not touch each other. So for example, if you make them a bit bigger, they still will not intersect with each other. And this gives an idea that maybe if we rearrange them a little bit, maybe there is enough of space for the tins one. And so this was a famous dispute between Isaac Newton and David Gregory. And Isaac Newton thought that uh, 12 is the maximum possible, while David Gregory thought that 13 is still possible. We just need to think really hard how to put it there. And so maybe this explains a little bit why we all know so much about Isaac Newton and remember now so little about David Gregory. <laughs> So David Gregory was wrong and Isaac Newton was right, but the uh, rigorous mathematical proof of this statement was obtained only at the 19th century. So long time after uh, the question arised. And so you see that even this much simpler local version of uh, uh, sphere packing problem in dimension three is not easy. And so let's look now closer into this dimension of uh, sphere packing in dimension three. So how can we construct, how do we construct, let's look back at this uh, pyramid of oranges, how do we construct it? So here, uh, what we do first, we let's construct our uh, configuration in, in layers. So this seems like a natural way. So we have, imagine that we have our infinite table and we put our oranges on a table. 
uh, so that their centers would, uh, would form a hexagonal lattice. So this is the best packing in dimension two. And uh, the next step, so now we are putting next layer of, this was the first layer of blue oranges, and now we've put the next layer of uh, green oranges, and we put green oranges into a holes between blue ones. But as you can see here, we cannot put a new orange into every hole between uh, the blue oranges because the distance will not be enough. And so we have to choose, but we have to, to put a green orange into every second hole. And then they again will form the centers of this uh, uh, green oranges. They will lie a bit higher, but all the centers, they will again be on one, in, in one surf, in one uh, plane and they will form a hexagonal lattice in this plane. And so this way we continue, and this is how we build our uh, packing. Uh, but there is another way how, to, how we can build a packing. So here's another way. So let's again build our packing in layers, uh, but this time we will not uh, work with hexagonal packing, but we will uh, work with a square packing. So we put our oranges in like first our blue oranges into this uh, a square in a square lattice. And now as we are putting the next layer, and uh, now the, because our uh, packing is not so dense anymore, uh, our flat plate packing is not so dense anymore. It means that the holes between uh, oranges became bigger. And now we can actually fit new uh, uh, ball into every, every hole. And we continue like this. So now, uh, it's, uh, of course, now each layer is not as dense as it was in the previous slide. However, uh, layers now are closer to each other. And this, now we have constructed these two different configurations. And so let's decide which one is denser. So maybe we can vote here. So if you think that uh, this one is denser, you can raise your hand. Okay. And you think that this one is denser, you can raise your hand. And if you think that two configurations are equally dense, you can raise your hand. Okay. So I should tell you that these two configurations, they are not uh, only equally dense, but if, we, if here, if we put our layers correct here, they will be even identical to each other. So these two configurations, which I've constructed into different ways, they are actually geometrically identical after a rotation in three-dimensional space. And so how can we see this? We can see this in the following way. So let's consider this configuration, which is called uh, a phase central cubic uh, lattice. And so why does it have this name? So we, we are taking this usual uh, cubic lattice, or if you are a mathematician, we are taking a lattice Z cubed. So just the lattice of all points, for example, with integer coordinates. So here I'm not, I don't uh, may pack with uh, balls of unit volume. I will maybe readjust the size of a ball. And so now I, pu I put one ball into a, a center of every uh, lattice point of this uh, cubic grid Z3. And also I will place one blue ball into a center of every face because I have these cubes. Cubes have faces and these faces have centers. And blue balls, they have their uh, centers coincide with the centers of the face. And I adjust the size of my ball so that uh, red balls and blue balls, they have equal radia and they uh, don't intersect and only touch each other. And so this is so-called phase central cubic or FCC lattice. And so uh, now let's see that this lattice is actually the same configuration as I have constructed by layers. And so to see that it's the same, let's color uh, these uh, uh, balls in, a, in two different ways. So first let's color them like this. So we'll take our uh, plane uh, to be, so the plane which is, uh, so to say, the diagonal plane of our, uh, our cube, so it's uh, orthogonal to the main diagonal of our cube. And so you see that each, uh, in each layer, I will have this perfect hexagonal lattice. And so you see that uh, 
this configuration is actually the same as the layered configuration I have constructed on my first slide. And so now we can color the same configuration, but, again, but differently. So now I color, uh, I, I take my uh, layers to be parallel to one of the faces of my uh, cube. And this way I get, uh, I see you, you can see that this FCC lattice is actually the same lattice as I have constructed in my uh, second layered example. And so, as you see, even three like three dimensional space we all live in, it can be quite uh, complicated and counterintuitive. And so to say a bit more, to explain you why this is a difficult problem, is that in uh, dimension three, actually this, uh, the FCC lattice is uh, the optimal solution, but as we know now, but it's not the only optimal solution. And actually we have uncountably many uh, equally dense uh, sphere packings in dimension three. And they, well, how we can we achieve that? So as I've told you, when we are building uh, our uh, configuration by the first method I've shown you, I've also told you that we cannot put a uh, ball of the new layer into every hole between uh, the balls of the lo lower layer. And so at each step, we have a choice which, uh, which holes to choose. And uh, as we can do these choices at every layer, uh, we, will, we can construct geometrically uh, uh, different uh, configurations, but they all will have the same density because the density of each layer is the same and the distance between layers is the same. And so this partially explains why sphere packing is in dimension three is such a complicated geometric problem. And so, but despite being so difficult, this problem was, was solved by Thomas Hales and he announced his uh, solution in 1998. And this was actually a very long uh, uh, proof uh, based on previous work of many of, of, of other people. And also it con contains a lot of, uh, uh, it was a maybe a first, one of the first computer assisted proofs of important mathematical result. And so this also was the reason why for a long time uh, mathematicians hesitated whether to accept this as a mathematical proof or not. And so what Thomas Hales did, except of this doing a like, huge work of proving Kepler's conjecture, he have also written a formally verifiable computer proof of it, and this project took to an, uh, almost another uh, decade. Uh, but at the same time, I think what was a big progress as on the way of doing this. He also d worked a lot on developing this uh, 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 computer verify software for verifying mathematical proofs and even for guessing and producing new mathematical proofs. And, uh, and so as uh, the Kepler's conjecture in dimension three is solved, so let's now go to other dimensions. And so in my first slide, I've casually introduced sphere packing for, for you as a sphere packing in d-dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, but maybe at least for some of you, it would be, I hope, it would be useful to, do, to know what is a d-dimensional Euclidean space. Because we have already seen the Euclidean space in dimensions one, two, and three. So here's again the Euclidean space of dimension three. And we know that every point in dimension three, it is given by three coordinates. But now as mathematicians, what we can do, we, nothing stops us from introducing more coordinates. And in a popular culture, uh, we know there are several, there is also this idea of higher dimensions, which I think is for people who want to do ge higher dimensional geometry are very misleading, right? Maybe, maybe you know about uh, the flatland, which is a two-dimensional uh, land populated with uh, rectangles with different number of space, or about uh, four-dimensional uh, aliens of Kurt Venigut, who can see through time. But of course, as for us phonematicians, uh, even though these are all very beautiful metaphors, they don't help us doing our job. Because our view of, um, of mathematics, of course, is just purely formal. So what we, if you want to introduce a d-dimensional Euclidean space, we will just, our points, it would be uh, uh, this, uh, 
arrays of d real coordinates. And now to make it an Euclidean space, another piece of information we need, we also need to measure distance between points. And so we are measuring distance according to Pythagorean rule. We are just generalizing it to the dimensions in the most natural way. And now we are actually, we are now set to consider, almost done to consider a sphere packing problem because now we have to uh, define what is a ball. And also one small thing, which I do not define here, but what we do have to do, we have to define what is a volume in the dimensional space. Uh, but once we have done all this, now our uh, sphere packing problem also makes sp sense in the dimensional space. And so what do we know about uh, sphere packing problem in D dimensions? And actually we know not that much. So here is an old, there is a nice paper by uh, John Conway and Neil Sloan written in 1995 where they describe uh, the best uh, uh, sphere packings in dimensions from 1 to 10. And so uh, here, uh, here I written, uh, so in green are those dimensions for which we actually know, or at least uh, as of today we know what is the best solution. And in black are those which are still, cases which are still open. So these are the best known configurations, but we don't have the proof that they are the best. And so you see in dimension one, of course, the best is the, like, uh, so here uh, uh, the centers of balls should be, uh, should coincide with uh, uh, integer points. And then of course, the also the balls have to be uh, uh, scaled in the right way so that they don't uh, intersect. So, and of course, in dimension one, it's a trivial problem. In dimension two, it's an easy problem. In dimension three, it's a complicated problem which was solved by Thomas Hales. And in dimension four, we have a unique solution, so-called lattice uh, D4. And we believe that this is the unique solution in dimension four. And in dimension five, it's actually similar to dimension three here. Also, we have one lattice called D5, and we also have uncountably many other packings. And in their nature, they're very similar to this uncountably many packings uh, which we have constructed for dimension three. They also come from putting smaller dimensional layers in the right uh, way. And so similar behavior is we have it for dimensions five, six, and seven. Here also we have some lattice packings, which are the densest packings, but also we have uncountably many equally dense packings. And in dimension eight, we have a unique E8 lattice, and in this case, we, we can prove that it is the best sphere backing. And now in dimensions 9 and 10, different wonders start to happen. So here are this pattern, which at some point, Conway and Sloan, they thought that this would work in all dimensions, as they write in their paper. Here, this idea breaks, and uh, just putting uh, old layers in a smart way is not working anymore. So in dimension uh, 9, it's still possible to uh, put together smaller dimensional pieces in the right way. However, they, uh, uh, Conway also discovered uh, not only these uncountably many packings, but he also discovered one continuous family of packings. So what he could have done, he could, have ta he could take this uh, particular lattice, divide uh, its balls into two different subsets, and he calls them golden balls and silver balls, and then continuously move them with respect to each other so that the new configuration is still a packing. Uh, and it has the same density. And in dimension 10, it's the first dimension where the best known packing is so-called uh, packing no uh, named after a mathematician with last name best. Uh, and it's what is interesting, it's a non-lattice packing. And we don't know any lattice which is as dense as this one, so it's a periodic, but non-lattice packing. And, uh, yes, and so this is, then these are all the cases that we do know. So we do know uh, sphere packing is solved in dimension one, two, and three. And also, I've, uh, in 2016, I've shown that the E8 in dimension eight is the best possible sphere packing and working together with Henry Cohn, Abinav Kumar, Stephen Miller, and Danilo Radchenko. 
we have proven that the uh, uh, leech lattice in dimension 24, it is the best baking configuration in this dimension. And maybe one interesting thing, as you can see, as, as our dimension goes up, uh, then the densities of our packings decrease. Uh, so, yes? Uh, in dimension 10, it's not a lattice, but does it come from stacking layers together? I, okay, I'm not, I don't think so. Uh, uh, maybe uh, one has to look at the paper of Kohn and Elkis, but I, I don't think it comes from stacking uh, smaller dimensional layers. Uh, yes, so uh, so one uh, important thing, you, ca you can see that the uh, density decays, and we know that as dimension grows, uh, then the density of the best uh, packing, it will decay exponentially. However, we don't know what this exponent should be, and so what is like 90% is what we can achieve at dimension 2, but in dimension 24 we can achieve only this about two thousandths of the space can be covered by balls, and in dimension 24, it's actually it's a very good result, and it's better than at least what we know at the moment we can achieve in dimension 23. <laughs> and so let me, but now let me speak a little bit about these two special configurations. So as you see that dimensions 8 and 24, they are somehow special, and the configurations we have here, they are special. They don't have this nasty behavior like three-dimensional best packings, because here in these both cases we have this unique configurations. And let me t tell you about what is so... Okay, so maybe this, uh, this is a photograph of uh, my collaborators. So you have already seen he Henry in this uh, uh, summer school, and this is also uh, Abhinav, Danilo, and Steven. And so, and this is the E8 lattice. Uh, so uh, this is uh, what is what you can see here. This is a, a zoom model of uh, the uh, shortest vectors of E8 lattice. So E8 lattice it has 240 shortest vectors, and those uh, 240 shortest vectors they solve the sphere packing problem in dimension eight. And dimension eight, it's also one of the few dimensions where sphere pack, uh, sorry, not sphere pack, the, the sphere kissing problem is completely uh, solved. And so uh, this lattice is known for a long time. So first it's, so it's the E8 lattice, it's the unique even unimo unimodular lattice in dimension eight. And what it means, it means that it, like we have uh, uh, one, uh, on average we have one point of this lattice per uh, unit of volume and even means that if we take any uh, distance between those two points uh, then it would be a square root of an even number. So length squared is always an even number. And this turned out to be a, a, like a rather restrictive uh, property. And so what was proven by uh, by uh, Smith in uh, the middle of uh, 19th century is that there exists at least one even unimodular lattice in dimension 8. And it's also interesting that his proof, it was not a construction, it was really an existence proof. Because he has proven a mass formula which uh, told us something about uh, this even unimodular lattices on average. And uh, he's shown that this, uh, the if the, uh, we take sum over all even unimodular lattices weighted by inverse of their automorphism group, then in dimension 8 this was a positive number, and therefore at least one lattice has to exist. But he did not give, uh, produce the lattice. And so the first explicit example was done by, an, by uh, Russian mathematicians Korkin and Zlatarov. Uh, like, how many? six uh, years later. Uh, but uh, E8 lattice is actually a famous uh, object in mathematics, and one reason for this it is that it is the root lattice of the E8 root system, and E8 root system appears in many uh, areas of mathematics, uh, for example, in classification of uh, Lie group and Lie algebras. And so it... Uh, 
it also enjoys a lot of uh, symmetries and uh, nice mathematical properties. And so another uh, special lattice is the uh, Leach lattice. And Leach lattice, it's may in some sense, it's, a, uh, it's also an, this extraordinary mathematical object. Uh, so Leach lattice, it's also an even unimodular lattice in dimension 24. And in dimension 24, we know that we have exactly 24 such lattices up to an isomorphism. And uh, if, you, if, as I told you, Leach lattice, it's an even lattice. It means that uh, all uh, the distances between po its points, they are square roots of even numbers. And so the smallest possible is square root of 2. And the Leach lattice is the only lattice among those 24, which has no vector of length square root of 2. So its shortest vector, vector has length 2. And this makes it a great candidate for for a backing problem. And for Leach lattice, it actually took longer for mathematicians to discover it. And so uh, first, maybe important step in discovery of a Leach lattice was actually done by engineers. So this is a portrait of Marseille Gallet. And in 1949, he have discovered a, an object called Gallet code, which I will speak about a bit later. And uh, so then the Canadian mathematician John Leach used Golly code to construct a Leach lattice from it. And he immediately recognized that it would be a, a gra great solution for sphere packing problem. And so this is a John Conway. And he studied uh, automorphism groups of uh, Leach lattice. And turns out that this lattice also has many symmetries. and uh, uh, symmetries of Leach lattice, they are very closely related to the discovery of uh, simple, simple sp sp of sporadic simple groups, and in particular to the discovery of the biggest uh, simple sporadic monster group. And finally, this is the portrait of uh, Richard Borchardt, who proved the monstrous moonshine uh, conjecture, which is also related to the monster group and somehow indirectly related to the Leach lattice. So it's also a lattice with a lot of interesting mathematical structure in it. And so, but so let me speak about a little again about Marseille Gallet and about the relation between Leach lattice and coding theory and also relation between sphere packing and coding theory. And so as I already to I hope that I convinced some of you that sphere packing it's a fun mathematical problem. But it's not the only way for studying it. And actually, sphere packing has some pra very practical applications. And so these applications, they were dis described by uh, Claude Shannon in his foundational works on information theory. And so here, uh, there are also portraits of Richard Hemming and Marseille Gollet. Uh, so they are people who also worked in coding theory and uh, uh, created first important examples of codes. For example, Richard Hemming is uh, very famous for Hemming code, and Hemming code is somehow a derivative of the E8 lattice, which we've seen before, and the Golly code f f found by Marseille Gallet. It was actually a first hint for mathematicians to discover a Leach lattice. And so let me explain the concept to you. So here is a very simplified uh, uh, version of signal transmission described in the paper by uh, <coughs> Claude, Shen Claude Shannon. So the pro problem he thought about was the following one. So suppose that we have a signal and we have to transmit this sig signal through a channel and in this channel we can have a noise. And so it means that our sig what we receive is not the original signal, but it's our signal plus error. And the problem is then how to, uh, we have to design our uh, system in such a way that these uh, mistakes, they can be spotted, they can be detected, uh, and also if they are detected, it's good if we are able to correct them. And you can imagine that problems like this, they arise in all kinds of uh, uh, real-world system, like 
For example, one of the uh, reasons why Hemming developed his Hemming code was that uh, he worked with very first LAMP computers, and they are very unreliable, and so he, they always made uh, mistakes, and then like misinterpreted zeros and ones, and so he wanted to have slightly better system that if one lamp does not work, he still doesn't have to rewrite all his program, and uh, maybe even the computer could correct it. But the, this uh, uh, diagram here, it, it works maybe better for, your, for our Wi-Fi connection, you know, if our, uh, you know, if we have a storm coming that we can still hear, uh, uh, decode the, the uh, signals. And so here's the uh, model which was suggested by Shannon. How can we use the sphere packing? So he suggested that in our ch channel, we do not send any words. We are, uh, in our channel, we are just picking certain number of code words which we are allowed to send. And we choose these code words so that they are far away from each other. And here, too, if we are thinking of some reasonable communication channel, we also think that our errors will not be too big, because if our errors are very big, then, of course, this whole uh, idea of using this channel is hopeless. So we hope that uh, our errors are small, and having big errors, this can only happen with small probability. And so this was one of the uh, mathematical uh, models he suggested, is so that around each of this uh, code word, we have, so to say, this uh, uh, ball of possible errors. And if these balls do not intersect, then after obtaining a corrupted signal, we still will, be, will know in, to, in which ball it, to which ball it belongs, and we could reconstruct our original problem. And so... And maybe one thing I should tell you that this error correcting codes they're still uh, used in uh, all kind of signals we are sending in our internet in mobile phones uh, but uh, and here's one nice example of actually of the using of Golay code so Golay code was used for example for a Voyager mission and it was really important to have a good error correction to uh, to be able to obtain enough information from from this apparatus. But of course this apparatus was sent long time ago, maybe even before I was born. And so right now in the error correction, the kind of uh, uh, sphere packings that are used are sphere packings in effectively infinite dimensional spaces. So this brings us away from this cozy realm of uh, small dimensions and uh, forces us to study very big dimensions. Okay, so maybe I will. And a few words about uh, what are other reasons for studying sphere packing. So as I told you, knowing the exact sphere packing is very useful and practical, but it's actually this is not my uh, main er areas, so what, what I ma mainly work on, I do not try to construct new sphere packings, but I rather try to prove bounds on sphere packings. I try to prove that, for example, for the leech lattice, leech lattice is great, but it, it, it cannot be improved. And uh, on one hand, maybe uh, this, the, the, the value of this work is, of course, that nobody is wasting their time on trying to improve leech lattice, uh, but also, uh, uh, other interesting reasons for studying uh, this bounds on sphere packings is that this kind of bounds, they're used not only in Euclidean geometry, but they're used in other problems. And so this is one uh, recent work by uh, theoretical physicists, uh, uh, Hartmann, uh, Delimil Matsak, and uh, Leonardo Rastelli. So what they found, they found that actually the uh, constraints which are used to uh, to prove bounds on sphere packing problem in Euclidean geometry, they also, for example, can be used to study 2, 2D conformal field theories. And so here I explain to you what are the uh, what is what is the sphere, sphere packing problem, and it is intuitively clear problem. Even though if we try to analyze it geometrically, then it becomes a complicated mathematical problem. 
And so 2D conformal field theories, they also, of course, can be formalized mathematically. And here, I will not be able to explain to you what, what the uh, idea behind 2D for, formal conformal field theories is. But it's, somehow, it's a problem which, is, even when it's uh, stated in mathematical language, it's something very, very different from sphere packing problem. It's a mathematical object, the mathematical object behind this problem, so it's a mathematical object of a very different nature. However, the same, exactly the same methods, they help us bound the density of sphere packing, but they also help us to constrain the spectra of these 2D dimensional conformal field theories. And so that's probably all I wanted to uh, tell you. So maybe now I will give you an opportunity to ask questions. Okay, do we have questions? Uh, when you talked about the error correcting code and having mm. many dimensions, I'm guessing that like in a practical sense you would have a different estimate of the error in each dimension you would make. And so is, really sp is sphere packing really what you want to do? So, I mean, they have several parameters, right? Um, and you, est you estimate you would do errors in each of the dimension. Mm, so okay, you, maybe I didn't like, when you send a signal, you send a signal with many, many different parameters, each corresponding to one of the dimensions you want to you wanna study, right? Uh, yes. Yeah, but it's okay. But I think in, in error correct, correcting, there are several models that work with it. And maybe like one thing where this, uh, uh, for which actually, actually sphere packing, like the Euclidean sphere packing is useful, uh, is probably the, this what's called like the uh, Gaussian noise model, where we hear, but but yeah, in, in, in this sense, like in my very, so here this is, a, I would say, a very uh, general picture and very often uh, these balls, they're not balls in Euclidean space. Sometimes these are actually balls in what you call the Hemming space. So this is just, I would say, a motivational picture. But so sometimes it does happen that we send signal where each coordinate is a real number and uh, our channel is modeled in such a way that actually Euclidean distance matters and then Euclidean packing becomes somehow relevant. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, if you have some images of some of the higher dimensional lattices projected into two or three dimensional space, uh, what, yes. what kinds of projections are, are happening there so that we're able to uh, visually make it? Okay, so this is, for example, leech lattice, and uh, so this is a, a pr projection, maybe not of the all lattice, but only of the shortest vectors. So there are these, like, uh, oh, where is like, oh, ha, ha, like, uh, hundred ninety-six by hundred sixty shortest uh, vectors of uh, leech lattice, and. Uh, uh, yeah, so, so here the plane is, of course, it is like a carefully chosen plane so that the picture is nice and uh, symmetrical, but I think I did not write anywhere which, which exactly plane this is. But yeah, this is some nicely chosen plane so that I think what we see here, we don't see all, all, all of the uh, uh, vectors because some of them project into one. I think some of them, like projections for some of them coincide here in this particular representation. There is a question there. Um, yeah. Okay, so there the things become a bit complicated. So there are some maybe there are some nice dimensions like dimension sixteen. There is there is a candidate and uh, but I think in very high dimensions it's just we know that little that people maybe don't want to conjecture and then to be proven wrong, so. <laughs> oh. Mm, four, I think four is an obvious candidate, but. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, it also seems quite 
far away right now. So, but but four but four is like a nice candidate it's because there there is this unique configuration D4, and D4 is not as great as E8 or Leech Lettuce, but it's still quite nice. So, I would bet for. Maybe may, I, I cannot say that it's not useful, but uh, I don't think it has somebody who has realized this idea so far. So I don't see why not. But uh, but I, but I think to, to like all the proofs that exist right now, they don't use that idea. Like for 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 example, in like whether that is like what's interesting with, uh, for example, E8 lattice and Leech lattice. If we, because if we like, reduce this uh, lattice, for example, like modular two, then uh, after some, essentially what we will like, get, we will get this uh, uh, codes like Hemming code and uh, Golay code, and those are known to be optimal as well, and they also like this perfect codes. On the other hand, we don't know how to use this information to prove optimality of Euclidean packings. I'm not sure, but m m maybe. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so this is certainly like this uh, and E8 and Leech lattice, they arise in many algebraic problems. So it's not difficult to construct them. I think they can be constructed in many, many ways. And maybe even, uh, may maybe, it's po may maybe it's possible, but I'm not 100% I'm not confident. Oh uh, yes. No, I think it's still a bit of a mystery. So it's just, uh, just uh, so, so of, of course we can look at like our proof and then see why it works in dimension eight, but I I, I don't have a re really good question why I don't have a simple question to uh, so sort of sim simple answer to this question. Um, for high dimensions, um, do we have a good simulation method to help us guess what is the best package? Mm, so I think it's, uh, uh, as I understand, cause I'm, I'm not very much like expert in simulations, but as I understand, like when dimension is small, it's like it's still up till some dimension simulations work great, and if it becomes a bit b better, they become terrible. So maybe that's w what the situation is. But I think it's actually si ma making simulations is not that easy because like for gradient, this I think this problem is very bad for gradient descent because there are this kind of like jammed configurations, the configurations that are not optimal, but they cannot be improved locally. So I think this is a nasty problem for, from that point of view. So, but of course it, 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 does, uh, it doesn't mean that there is no method, maybe, but but I think there is no very good method right now. And also I think here there is some kind of this like course of dimensionality that it could happen that in dimension eight things work great and find the yeah, latest for you. But in slightly bigger dimension, everything already is ruined and yeah, there is no more confidence that. And here also maybe like one of the problems is that it's difficult, like wh what can we compare with? Because our uh, upper bounds are also quite bad at the moment. So if you are constructing some configuration, how do you know it is the best? H how to gain this confidence? It's maybe also something that is not so clear. Yes? Uh, actually, we, we, uh, we already know that it does not work in higher dimensions, and uh, yeah, so this is maybe answer to like also related to the question before, like why it works in eight twenty four. So actually, this method of the uh, the uh, Konelki's uh, linear programming bound, it 
gives us perfect result in dimensions 8 and 24, and it does not give us perfect result in other dimensions, and we don't even we know that's the fact, and in some dimensions we can even prove that it's the fact, but uh, why is still a, it's like a more philosophical question, and I don't think we have satisfactory answer to that. Uh, yes? Uh, yes, yeah, so as I understand, the question is about considering the uh, packing with uh, spheres of two different radii. Uh, yes, yeah, so this problem is considered, and uh, of course there it's maybe m more difficult to analyze it in higher dimensions, but at least in dimension three, I think it is, uh, there are works like this, mostly computational, also some bounds. Yes, yeah, so, so, so in general this problem is considered, but mostly I would say from the computational point of view. And I think this kind of problem is also very interesting for simulations, because here even in small dimensions it's possible to get like new interesting results and it's not as badly behaved as uh, this finding sphere packings in higher dimensions. Any other questions? Not really, so, so this is, uh, I think it's mostly believed that uh, probably in very high dimensions the best packing would be chaotic, but I think we know too little to support this. Uh, also when you say that, oh, like, like in dimension 10 we have this non-lattice configuration, but in, then in dimension 24 we have leech lattice which has all this like wonderful symmetries, so it's, it doesn't seem to be a very regular pattern and yeah, and I think if you we have this like philosophy that uh, there is a finite number of exceptional objects in mathematics, then maybe yeah, maybe it means that in very high dimensions we exhaust all these exceptional tricks, and we just have to live with chaos. But yeah, but that's <laughs> maybe more of a philosophy than mathematics at this point. And also, like I think, for, for when you want to construct something in very high dimensions. Actually, symmetry seems like our only guide, and symmetry what helps us to construct or to prove the existence of dense things. So it's yeah, not that easy to answer that question. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uncountably many other packings were. Uh, yeah, so, so what, what uh, I think I told you everything I knew, <laughs> so maybe... <laughs> say it again. <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe I can say it again, so, uh, yeah, so, so this uncountably many comes from the fact that uh, as, as we are, like, stocking uh, the, uh, this hexagonal lattices upon each other, at each, for each step we have two choices, and so it means that, uh, like, we can uh, index our, uh, uh, packings by, for example, this like uh, by in infinite words, right? But like, uh, each time it's like uh, like either like A or B, and we ca we have uncountably many infinite words uh, of two consisting of two letters. And then of course, like there is maybe some subtle thing is that maybe we it's, it can happen that we have constructed two packings in different way, but then they turn out to be geometrically identical. So this is a slightly subtle point, but mathematicians still worked it out, and they do confirm that we have uncountably many uh, packings. Yes. Okay. Yep. What was the original reason why you got uh, interested in the sphere packing problem? Okay, uh, yeah, so I think it's a nice problem also when I started working on it, I already knew about work of uh, Conan Delkis and I think it was a, a beautiful paper where it seemed like, you know, there is 
they almost solved it and there was only the last step to be done and, and I think it's very attractive, right? So. Any other questions? Yeah, please, go ahead. Yeah, so similar methods, that like linear programming ideas, they do apply to tetrahedra, even though because tetrahedra doesn't have this rotational symmetry, things become technically more complicated. And actually here, I don't know what is the state of the art and how far away are we from sharp bounds. Yeah, so in, in, in principle, these ideas, they still work, but it's not clear whether they give sharp bounds or not. Any other thing? Anything else? Uh, so in your talk, you presented uh, a sphere kissing and a sphere packing in three dimensions. And you also mentioned for dimension eight that sphere kissing was already known in dimension eight. So yes. Yes, yeah, so the connection is indirect. It's, um, I think it's not, it's clear that two problems are somehow related to each other and this sphere kissing, it's like, it looks like a local version of uh, sphere packing and it's possible to, follow, to have some quantitative uh, connection between those two. But of course, the solution of one problem does not imply the solution of another and vice versa. And so here I think it's uh, quite uh, uh, remarkable that for, uh, and I think also not, maybe not yet completely understood, uh, that so this linear programming method, it helps to solve, it solves the sphere kissing problem in dimensions eight and 24. And so this was done by Levenstein and independently by Adlishka and Sloan, uh, still in, uh, I think in seven, 1979. And then again, linear programming, only a different one, the, uh, Con Elkis linear programming uh, uh, solves packing problem in dimensions eight and twenty four, and uh, this is of course yeah. I mean, and I think at this moment, at least I don't know what what's the connection. These two facts they seem to be of course re related to each other. On one hand, on the other hand, I don't know like any formal connection between formal mathematical connection between them. So it's yeah, maybe it's something yet to be understood. And, yeah. Yes? I don't know about uh, that. Uh, some, uh, um, yes, so I don't, don't know. Okay, well, in the interest of time, we've, uh, we're at 4.15, so we'll stop here. Marina's around through the end of the week, I mm -hmm. believe, so um, please catch her with more questions. Mm -hmm. And again, let's thank uh, her very much for a nice talk. Mm -hmm.